Tyler ISD Board of Trustees was previously called to order. The presence of a quorum has been established. The meeting has been duly called and the notice of the meeting has been posted in the time and manner required. Monthly meetings of the board are designed to cut, conduct the business of governing the school system in public. However, this is not a meeting to interact with the public. We welcome you as guests to observe and listen. And we do have a scheduled time within the agenda for the public to address the board. As is our custom, we will begin our public meeting with prayer and pledge of allegiance. If you stay seated, we'll pray and then we'll stand for the pledge. Uh, and I'm up for the prayer. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you uh, in desperate need, in desperate need of your grace and your mercy and your love towards us and in need of your wisdom. Father, you've said that... Uh, if we need wisdom, all we must do is ask. And so, Father, we come to you as stewards of the school district in search of wisdom from you, Father, that you would guide us and that you would direct us. Father, as we uh, hit the midpoint of the summer, uh, I pray for our staff, for uh, their safety and for their preparation for the upcoming year. I uh, pray that you'd give them uh, excitement and energy and passion as they prepare for the students to arrive. Father, I know of several health issues that our employees are dealing with and uh, our staff, and I'm sure there's many more. Uh, Father, so we just ask for your blessing and for your healing power over our employees who are battling illness. And Father, for the students of Tyler ISD, I pray for protection during the summer as they go out and uh, do all the things that kids do in the summer as our athletes come back to school and begin to prepare. Pray for uh, protection over them. And Father, that you would uh, guide them and help them prepare for a great year. Uh, we pray all this in the name of Jesus and the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> Okay, we have one item for action coming out of executive session, be item C. We have any discussion on this item? I'll just say I think that um, it's great when we are not using a property uh, that we get it in the community's hands and if there's somebody that can do something with that, um, that uh, we are more than happy to cooperate with them and grateful for North Tyler Day Nursery for stepping up and we look forward to them having many good years in that building. And while Miss Mason couldn't be here tonight, uh, she wanted to make sure that everybody knew that uh, she hopes the building will be kept up because the neighborhood will expect it, both the grounds and the building. and. Uh, there are expectations in the neighborhood to be good stewards of the property. It's been a pleasure to work with North Tyler Day Nursery along with our uh, council uh, here in the district uh, to uh, go through this process. It's, it's been a year, I think, or, or a little bit, little bit inside of a year uh, since we've actually started uh, planning for this with North Tyler Day Nursery. So Jim Wooldridge and uh, Joanne Hampton etc with the rest of their uh, Thorndike Lewis with uh, the rest of their board has been a joy to work with as we've been going through the process any other comments if not I will take a motion on item C I move we accept the administration's recommendation to approve the transfer and final sale of the former Griffin Elementary listed here to North Tyler Day Nursery Thank you, Mr. Bergfeld. Do I have a second? Second. second. We have all sorts of seconds. <laughs> um, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, we have the approval of minutes. Any discussion, any noted, any changes to the minutes as presented? Minutes look good to me. Gina's done an excellent job once again. She is the board secretary. Yes. Okay, then if there's no discussion, I'll take a motion for the approval of A, B, and C. I move we approve A, B, and C. And a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next on the agenda is item number eight. Lone Star Governance, where we focus on continuous improvement student outcomes. Dr. Crawford? As uh, Dr. Hansen is coming up to the, uh, to the table, pre presentation table, is Ms. Bonetta going to join you or just you? Oh, Dr. Curitan is going to do it. So Dr. Curitan is director of data and anal analytics and all those other good buzzwords that we like to use. Um, the, the great thing is this time of year is when we start rolling in, uh, we start getting some of our academic data coming back to us all the way from obviously third grade reading all the way to AP scores and career technology education certifications, dual credit performance completion. Um, so we're happy to present this to you, you guys. Uh, we're looking for some uh, positive news come mid-August in regard to accountability ratings. Uh, we're not confident enough to, to release those. Uh, Y'all might have seen a table that was released to the to the Tyler paper. Uh, appreciate them reporting that, uh, but at the same time, some of that was some inaccurate data. So I want to go on public and saying that here at the board meeting. Sorry about that, Corey. We'll, we'll try not to provide you inaccurate data. I know great article though. Okay. Very well. Um, but but we do have uh, uh, Dr. Hanson, our assistant superintendent for CNI, along with Dr. Curitan uh, over in data and analytics uh, that's going to present to you guys tonight uh, in regard to our data and assessment. Uh, in regard to a third grade reading star data. Okay, well thank you for this opportunity. We're just gonna present a short summary as it pertains to uh, Tyler ISD's goals. So I'll go ahead and get started. The goal that we're focused on is uh, goal number one, which is 85% of kindergarten through third grade students will be at reading grade level uh, writ by spring 2021. And the portion of that goal that we're focused on tonight is 68% of our students will meet standard on the third grade reading test. Um, before I move on, I just want to kind of give you a, a brief breakdown because this is not what we usually do here. Um, we're always focused and the goal is focused on what's called percent approaching, which is a percent passing, percent of kids that are passing a particular test. Uh, tonight, I'm going to present a little bit more data than that. I'm going to present some data uh, in terms of our advanced students, our students that are mastering the third grade reading test, uh, because I think it's important to provide a more thorough perspective of, of how our kids did, our students did. So if we look at our data compared to last year, um, if we look at the percent of students approaching or percent of students passing grade level, last year it was at 64% in the spring of 2016. Uh, in the spring of 2017, so this, this go around this year, uh, our average stayed at 64% and our target was a little bit higher than that. Our target was actually 68%. Uh, so we expected it a little bit higher, um, we fell a little bit short. Relative to the state of Texas averages in 2017, it was about 72% um, this year. And so from this perspective, it seems like we did fall a little bit short of our, of our 2017 goal. If we break it down by campus and see how each individual campus did, uh, this table just shows you the number of campuses that declined by greater than 5%. The campuses that we said didn't really show an improvement or decline, and then the <coughs> number of campuses that improved. Uh, and obviously I want to draw your attention to the number of campuses that improved because I think it's worthy of looking at, especially as you look at the bottom of, that ta uh, bottom of the, the slide and you see that Griffin, Jones, Orr, and Ramey all improved by greater than 10% and Ramey in particular improved the percent of kids that were passing by over 26% compared to last year. Um, and so I certainly think that's worthy of recognition uh, for their efforts. If we take this data even further and we break it down by the majority of our subpopulations, uh, we can actually see that we didn't see any significant drops in any of our subpopulations. So they all did comparable to what they did last year in terms of passing. So the percent of students passing stayed the same between last year and this year. There was a minor drop uh, in the white subpopulation, 
and the African American subpopulation, but largely we see pretty consistent numbers. I do want to draw um, a special attention to special education because they improved the percent of students that were passing the third grade reading test by over 14 percent. And again, that's pretty significant when you look at the rest of the subpopulations that we have up there and that they didn't improve as much as special ed did. So again, I think that's worthy of us, of us uh, drawing attention to. So here's kind of where I want to uh, take a, a, a bigger picture perspective. On the left, just to keep it real simple, is how we did last year. It's just a, a frequency distribution of how we did last year. That's what all of our, our students together did. Uh, we had 64% pass and 18% master or score advanced on the test. This year is the distribution on the right where it says 2017 star scores. And our approaching percentage is the same, 64%, but our mastery went up to 23%. So we had 23% of our kids, our students this year, master third grade reading as opposed to last year. And that's the advanced. That is the advanced, um, the advanced students. And so generally, if you look at this particular distribution, I won't give you the exact numbers, but if you look at about where 90 is on that on the horizontal line on the x-axis, if you look at 2016 compared to 2017, we had nearly twice as many kids score 90 or above this year as compared to last year on the third grade reading test. So again, it's a dramatic improvement that's not necessarily reflected if we just look at the approaching percentage. And again, I think it's worth, it's worth mentioning considering the effort put in by everybody. Um, and there's just kind of the two peaks you can see. We had one last year, but this year we can see a higher percentage uh, scoring the, mass, the advance compared to the uh, passing percentage. If we just break this down, you can see it a little bit better here. Our approaching, our passing percentage stayed the same. Our advance percentage went up by about 5%. And based on our numbers, our enrollment, that's about 70 more kids, more students, scoring advanced this year as opposed to last year. Um, which is, again, pretty significant when you look at the overall number of students that tested. If we break that down by campus and just look at that compared to what, what uh, the percent of students that were passing and how they changed across the campuses, uh, on the bottom is the percent of students at master grade level or advanced, and the top is the passing percentages, which I showed you before. And what you'll notice on the bottom is that we had seven campuses that improved their mastery, or their advanced, percent of advanced kids. We had nine campuses that showed no change, but of those nine, seven of them showed a change greater than 0%. So 14 of the 17 elementary campuses showed some positive change in the percent of mastery or percent advanced, percent of advanced students at their school, which is, again, not necessarily reflected in the percent passing. If we break it down by subpopulation, I think this is particularly impressive. Every subpopulation, every major subpopulation uh, in terms of enrollment showed improvement in mastery. It wasn't one sub subpopulation driving this pattern. We saw improvements in our economically disadvantaged students, our African American students, our Hispanic, our white, our LEP population, and our special ed population. All of them improved the percent mastery compared to last year, or percent advanced. Uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on this because this is, we've talked about this um, and we've, I've given this information to curriculum and they're gonna use it uh, to help improve next year. So just kind of summarize what we're, what we're looking at here, uh, we saw that the percent approaching, the percent passing stayed the same from last year to this year. But if we look at the percent mastery or the percent advanced <coughs> students, we saw an increase by about 5% or about 70 students uh, compared to last year, which is about double what we, what we had last year. We didn't see any significant declines in the percent of students passing with regard to subpopulations, but we did see every subpopulation increase. So I think our focus needs to be on growing our lower achieving students, but we still need to continue to challenge our higher achieving students and not let them, uh, let them fall back a little bit. So what we know is that the students who are significantly struggling in, in two or three grade levels below grade level, um, those are the students that, uh, of course, still are still struggling. Um, the, the good news in the data is, is that the students who are um, in the middle of the road and high, our high achieving students, we're doing great things with them. And we're, sh and we're seeing growth and progress with, um, with students who are within a grade level. Um, but students that are two grade levels below, they're, they're continuing to struggle. So we know that that certainly continues to be a fo focus for us. 
<clears throat> Comments or questions? Yeah, ex maybe want to explain to the public a little bit on those percent mastery and the improvement there. Right. Where does that, we're still on the, in, the four indice accountability system, where does that fall into what indi indices do, do, do Right, so, so for this year, that's going to count for index four for us. Okay. Um, next year, for the, the great news is next year with the domains, we're going to get points for every student we move from one, from approaches to master, to meets to masters. So we'll get extra points for kids that we move. So, so if we were doing the accountability, that would have been a great point that we would have gained a lot of points for that. Um, which we anticipate that we will. So we've worked really hard to ensure that we are able to get our kids that the college and career readiness, which is what index four is. We had 26 of our 27 campuses achieve index four this year, which means that they are getting kids college and career ready. And if I could add a little bit to that, next year as well, uh, domain one, so index one this year is just the passing percentage. How many, how many students on your campus pass the STAR test? Thank you. Uh, next year, domain one is no longer going to be, or it's unlikely to be, just the passing percentage. Now it's going to focus on the percent of students that pass, but also the percent that you get advanced. And it could be as much as a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning you get as much credit as a, for a student that passes as you do as a, for an advanced student. And so we really need to continue to, to improve the masters, which is why, and I forgot to point that out initially, but that's why we wanted to focus on that. It's gonna be a huge issue in the upcoming accountability system. And I think this reflects that we're moving in a positive direction with it. Yeah, and the rule book for the new accountability system, for the future accountability system is not published yet. We only get bits and pieces of what's gonna be in it. Uh, the commissioner, we've done, gone enough presentations to know where he's kind of going with this, but he has a lot of authority in regard to uh, what that's going to look like along with some of his experts at the agency um, they are going you know we've gotten away from some of our subpopulations uh, so we focused on that tonight where we saw improvement in every subpopulation as far as advanced kids go you will wind up seeing some more focus on that uh, in the new accountability system is what we're hearing it's again it's not a, a done deal but but uh, you know the, the last five years or so because because texas demographics have changed so much uh, that we kind of gotten away from that but but it is important to know and keep track of that we we've still been keeping track of that obviously but we haven't been scored for on it and it looks like the new accountability system you will begin being scored on subpopulations again the college and career readiness the commissioner is big on the college and career readiness and that is essentially when a student gets the mastery level they're considered college and career ready and so we know that that's a big piece for us. And there is also a direct correlation. Once a student reaches that mastery level, we know that he or she will do well in pre-AP and AP courses, which goes back into our other two goals, goals two and three. Any other questions? I had a couple. Um, so. The slide that's up there for now, just for clarification, I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand it or in case I don't understand it properly. Our overall goal is not that only 68% of our kids would pass the test. Okay. This is an interim step in terms of our continuous improvement. So if someone were to walk into this meeting, look directly at this slide and say, Tyler ISD has set their sights too low, this is really, I'm reading it correctly in that this is an interim goal on our way to the 85% goal. The progress measure, we call it. Right. So the, the, the goal 1.1, the point one is the progress measure that, that we help you monitor to ensure that we're making the gains that you anticipate that we should make to get to the 85%. 85% is ultimately the goal. Right, okay. The second question then is, uh, periodically we hear from year to year about tests being harder or easier or um, the <coughs> standards move around in terms of the cut scores and all those things as we're looking at um, at the approaching grade level essentially flat scores do we feel like that's apples to apples or was it harder this year or easier this year or the test was different this year so okay. it was a completely different test um, they shortened some of the tests, removed, um, that's a big consideration because you're, 
numerator is different, right? So, um, so it's going back to Dr. Crawford's batting average. You know, if you're the more times you get up bat, you're, you're going to have to go. If you're a good hitter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want a lot of at bats, right? So um, don't shrink my sample size, <laughs> my, my plate appearances. So yes, it, I mean, ne we cannot compare apple, they are apples to oranges. There's a long article about that. Um, but we're, we have to use comparative data. Yep. So the test was completely different this year. The other thing that's really important to know about the assessments is that once kids across the state master a standard, they take that off the test. So they, um, as soon as that standard is passed across the state, they take that standard off. So they're only testing standards that kids across the state have not mastered. So that's an important consideration. So once we do a good job on a speci specific standard and we get kids to pass it, well, they take that one off. So, so, but the test was completely different. It was a completely different test this year. Okay. And then my, uh, I just forgot my final question, so I guess I won't ask the final question. <laughs> no, I do. I just remembered it. Um, so we've got this picture of, um, consistent performance improvement in mastery um, walk us back nine months ago and what actions did you say as a district we were going to take that drove these results and um, some of the the last this last year what we did that we feel like made a big difference um, we had very consistent data protocols at the campuses so when we went through the assessments um, the ca campuses were able to uh, really assess the data as the year went along and intervene for students as we saw them struggle. And so we felt like that made a big difference. We obviously put a lot of stake into our map data and um, we knew where the kids went on the learning progression where they were struggling. Um, I, I really anticipate our new curriculum, of course. I have a lot of faith in our new curriculum, so I, I know that that's gonna help ultimately it's not going to bring the third grade scores up this year right because they won't have the exposure as much we are changing the literacy the reading curriculum in third grade um <clears throat> but we anticipate we'll really see the dip more i mean the increase more next year after they've had a couple years of exposure to it speaking of so 68 percent was the goal this year i know 2021 is 85 percent what's mm -hmm. next year's goal as a reminder Oh, I think we get into 72, 72. I believe it's 72 or 73. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we meet goal, we'll see a pretty significant. <clears throat> yes. We've got, we, sure. we have some ground to make up for sure. <laughs> and, and also, Reverend Hager, I do, don't want to let that question go without talking about great leadership at the campus. And um, I mean, one of the things we really did put in place is we have great leaders at the campus and that's, and if we had to choose one thing, that was the one thing that made the difference um, beyond everything else. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all, thank you. We're now at the scheduled time in our agenda for public comment. The board wishes to hear your, the public's thoughts and concerns. As per board policy, all speakers must have submitted a participation form 10 minutes prior to the start of our session. We have one uh, public speaker tonight, Ms. Maureen Kaiser, speaking on the state of the PTA Council. Good evening, Reverend Hager, Dr. Crawford, board members. I'm Maureen Kaiser, as uh, Reverend Hager said, a council president for our school district's PTAs. And on behalf of the PTAs in Tyler ISD, thank you for your service to our children, our families, and our community. As a volunteer-based organization, we understand and appreciate the amount of time that you put in to serving our communities. The length of your agendas alone puts you in a class of like super volunteers. <laughs> but because we value the partnership between the superintendent and the school board, community, and PTA, and because we count on your continued support, I wanted to give you a brief update this evening on important work and training that is occurring to ensure a strong PTA presence in this district. There are currently 24 PTAs within Tyler ISD, and these PTAs all comprise our council. 
Last year, we rechartered two PTAs, Ramey and Jones, which really helped reestablish parent involvement as a priority on those campuses. As the early college high school becomes an individual campus, we have reached out to them and are discussing chartering them as our 25th PTA in Tyler. That's still to be determined, but the invitation's been extended. Throughout the district, we had 3,678 members last school year. PTA members logged 6,372 volunteer hours through the Raptor system last year. That is the equivalent to 159.4 40-hour work weeks. So if you paid those volunteers minimum wage, that volunteer time would have cost $26,665.50 plus benefits. But if you know any of our PTA volunteers, they're worth a lot more than minimum wage. <coughs> As you know from your own experiences, what drives volunteering is love, concern, and commitment, and we can't put a price tag on that. Our vision for the Council of PTAs this school year is to continue to build strong PTAs that facilitate family engagement on their campuses. When parents are involved in the lives of their students, the children will be stronger in every way. How we're gonna accomplish this vision is by mentoring PTAs that are growing and building, and by creating an environment where our PTAs can exchange their very best ideas and build on one another's successes. We also offer multiple trainings throughout the year on topics such as, this is fun, meeting IRS requirements, PTA jobs, family engagement, parent education, state advocacy, other such things. I'd urge you to join a PTA or more than one this year to, and also to encourage any faculty members that you know to do the same. It is after all the Parent Teacher Association. I gave Ms. Orr some membership forms that would allow you to join any or every PTA in Tyler. And just as a reminder, each campus can become a Golden Apple Award winner if 100% of their faculty joins the PTA. And that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big award to get. There is a new excitement about being involved in PTA and we really look forward to another year of working together for the good of what's most important, which is our students. Please know that we are here to support your efforts. We are very, very grateful for the time that you give to our students. Don't hesitate to call on the PTA whenever we can help. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kaiser. Thank you. Next, we're moving to item 10, the business legal finance consent agenda. And do we have any discussion on these items or desire to pull any items? D and E from the administration. Okay, D and E. Also pull, pull, pull F. Pull also. F as well. Any other items to be pulled or any other discussion of these prior to a motion? If not, I'll entertain a motion for um, item 10 A, B, C. GHI. I move we approve uh, items A through I with the exception of D, E, and F. Thank you, Mr. Washman. A second. Is that Mr. Martinez? Mm -hmm. with a second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Crawford, you want to take D and E together or separately? Uh, we can take them together. And, okay. Um, just a real court, uh, short explanation. Um, Tyler ISD is a, a self-funded district in terms of its uh, in insurance and benefits that we offer to our employees. Unlike the state of Texas, uh, most of the state of Texas, most of the state of Texas does have to participate on TRS care uh, or active care, whatever they're calling it these, these days. I don't know, it's been four years since I've been a part of that system. It does provide this school district a uh, competitive advantage when it comes to salaries. Uh, typically, an employee on our, uh, uh, that does participate in our health care, self-funded uh, self insurance program, uh, can typically realize uh, four to $10,000 in their take home, in their back pocket, as compared to working with a school district that actually works uh, with uh, TRS on the, on the state's plan. So, um, I don't think a lot of folks uh, uh, get, you know, we don't get the attention to that as, as we need to. Not only are we competitive salary wise, but you're not going to be paying as much for health care if you work for Tyler ISD. So that is a perk to work here. Um, we've had a, a long standing run with East Texas Medical Center. Uh, we had two uh, 
both local hospitals com uh, we competitively bid that and uh, we do have the choice to uh, to go with ETMC uh, here for the uh, for the next year typically we do these things in three years uh, fortunately ETMC allowed us to uh, bring back a proposal to them for one year extension uh, to where we actually will take this uh, this year to uh, to vet uh, both uh, both hospitals and, and their programs again we've already went through that this year as far as a consultant goes we will have an, uh, a consultant look at it again and the reason we did that obviously we've had a uh, we have to look at the bottom line for our employees for your budget as well there was a uh, a significant difference between both hospital uh, proposals um, so we wanted to make sure we did the right thing on the budget but the other thing is we want to make sure that we were uh, getting a good look at this. We've had a, uh, I think for the last 12 years, 12 to 15 years we've been on, we've been with ETMC. Anytime you've had that type of length uh, with that amount of expenditure, I do, I do think it does, uh, it does the, the administration uh, some good to bring to the board an, an option to, to, to take a look at it again and not get married up again to, uh, for another three years. So we'll be taking a look at that. And the other thing is we, we do know that ETMC has had some, uh, a little bit of instability in regard to their, to their financial program. We want to make sure that we want to see that settle down if we were going to enter into a three-year commitment with them. So uh, we'll be coming back to you again this time next year. Uh, the, the, the insurance committee that we, that we have with uh, district employees along with some administrators and uh, other staff did come with a three-year recommendation with the ETMC, but uh, of course we, we're keeping our eye on, 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 a, on a bigger picture as well and want to make sure that we brought this to y'all. So uh, again, not getting any specific numbers other than what it typically the difference is between, you know, Tyler ISD and XISD out there, self-funded self versus the state's plan is about the only thing that I would like to, to talk about. Everything else is in the packet. Uh, so I want to make a presentation here in open session about the reason we went for a year here uh, and, and did not switch over and we did not uh, marry up for, for, for another three years. And then the, the, the second part of this request, I guess, E is, is what's happening with our rates. Our rates to employees are going up 5%. Is, I'm, I've heard in the press lots of complaints about uh, retirees' health care under TRS. Sure. Um, in terms of very significant increases. Do we know what the comparable rate increase for premiums would be for TRS care um, for current teachers? What you're looking at right now, and of course a lot of folks are finalizing their budgets. Um, so and it, we, we, we've, we've guesstimated, and we, we'll, we'll have this more firmed up for you at the next meeting um, as far as uh, numbers go, but it looks like if uh, Let's say we gave a fifteen hundred dollar raise, which I think is what we're proposing uh, this this uh, this year. That an employee with that percentage would actually realize twelve hundred dollars of that, whereas that's on your self-insured plan. Whereas if you're on a TRS plan similar to that, you would you would basically be getting enough raise to cover your rise in premiums. So um, again, I think uh, because of the advantage that we have in regard to that. Uh, an employee in Tyler ISD will actually be able, to, if they participate in this in, on our insurance, will be able to realize that um, without being severely impacted. Um, you know, we've gone in Texas and 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 across the nation. I think when you talk talk about teacher compensation, we've been just able to keep pace, if we could, uh, with the the rising cost of health care. Whenever we start talking about compensation, so. Um, this year, we think our teachers are going to be able to realize a significant salary increase uh, that, that won't be eaten up by the rise in premiums. Okay. Hope that answers your question. Okay. For retirees, that's a totally different thing. We, we all pay into uh, retirement as you're an employee along with health care for retirement. And uh, there is an issue. I think they, they, they had a 300% jump or something like that on retirees. And that's why they're in Austin right now with the special session trying to figure something out that won't impact folks like my mom and dad. Okay, any other discussions on D&E? <coughs> if not, I'll take a motion. I move we approve items D&E. 
as recommended. Thank you, Mr. Bergfeld. A second? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item F. Yeah, item F is a uh, uh, quite a project that we we have in front of the board for a recommendation. Uh, that is the uh, district telephone system purchase. Uh, it does include uh, some of the, uh, I guess, the brains of the operation as far as that goes, um, along with uh, uh, materials and, and whatnot. Uh, Mr. Orball, I'd like you to come up here. You, you certainly have the technical expertise to describe this uh, in depth in regard to what it looks like and then what the future may hold at the two high schools with the, the, the pending construction. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the existing system we have right now is around 15 years old. Uh, it is no longer supported. We can no longer expand it. Uh, parts are becoming scarce and expensive. And so we're really well past the useful life of the, the foam system. So we began looking at uh, this project uh, for the last couple of years, planning and examining a variety of products, and we selected the Cisco foam system. Um, and the initial piece of that began uh, with the last bond issue when we added the new foam systems for CTC and Three Lakes Middle School. So the heart of the system has already been established and was paid for uh, out of the prior bond issue. The, um, in the coming bond issue, uh, I know some concerns were raised about whether we might be spending money unnecessarily or losing something in the transition from older campuses to the new. And in this system, we will not be uh, using, uh, or excuse me, losing any funds uh, the new system uses the exact same wiring that's already in place for the old. So it's simply a matter of plugging the sets in, programming them appropriately, and they're off and running. When it comes time to move them to the new building, it's a simple matter of unplugging it, walking it over to the new office or classroom, plugging it in, and the system automatically finds its way back home. We don't have to touch them again after that initial programming. Uh, so once they're plugged in, they find their, their way back to the server and automatically come up. So there's really, after this initial install, there's practically nothing that we have to do other than physically move them. So in this case, we're not pouring money into a school we're about to uh, mm, doze? No, sir. Okay. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And this system uh, is our intercom system. It, it ties into the PA system, the overhead PA as well. So when announcements are made, they're heard in the hallways through overhead speakers, they're heard in the classrooms through the speakers built into the telephone sets themselves. So it ties all those systems together uh, on the campus as well. You know, I, figuring out how to bring this to y'all, um, I, I guess one advantage is, is, you know, we have not sunk a lot of debt into technology because it does, it depreciates fairly quickly. Um, so I, I guess in saying this, you know, we, we always have FF and E, furnitures, fixtures, and equipment. Is that what that, sta that stands for? Yes. In every bond. Um, and so we, you know, at, at both high schools, we're still going to look at some innovative ways to communicate that aren't your traditional phones. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, when we when we take these phones over, uh, we, uh, the teacher work areas along with their department uh, offices will actually have capa capabilities to be able to plug these phones in as well. So it's not like saying that we're going to have a phone in every classroom. We're still looking at some options that, in regard to that. But again, if we were going to buy phones, it would have been with FF&E, which is debt money. And we certainly you know, want to do what we can to limit our exposure to anything that's going to depreciate really quickly. So this was uh, actually in, in this budget this year. Was it in last year's budget, too? We just didn't do it? Yes, sir. And so we just kind of went ahead and brought it back this year. So Tasha has already planned for that. We appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so when we look around the state, uh, <clears throat> districts that are building new schools, I find examples of both, where there are, are phones in classrooms and where they're not. So we can see it done both ways. Uh, both are viable solutions. We just need to decide which is our best way of communicating into those classrooms sure. for and us. And the, the technology on the safety end of it, again, you mentioned the PA. 
Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's ever not going to be a need in the world we live in to, to be able to communicate if there are disruptions, uh, whether internal or external. And uh, I think these new systems actually could actually, you could have an announcement made to all of our campuses from the superintendent's office to each and every system phone set. I don't know if I'll ever do that. Maybe to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. But um, uh, but I, I do think that there's some value in the safety, uh, especially since we've gone from the old days of the old big as that podium or console, four of them consoles mm -hmm. to where you flipped up the little knobs to communicate uh, campus wide. We actually use our phones now to do that. So and this system will will be a true district phone system. Right now we're operating 34 phone systems, one on each campus. This is one phone system that serves the entire district uh, from the central uh, administration. And it'll be established so that each employee will be given a phone number and that phone number is theirs and it will follow them no matter where they go in the district. They move from campus to campus, campus administration, however they're moved around, that's their number for as long as they're employed with us. And so that smooths out a lot of communication as well too, trying to update lists constantly and chase people around. So we had sporadic, over the last three years of my tenure here, we have sporadic emails that go out from communications that talk about phones are out at Jones, phones yes. are out at Griffin. Yes. And it, always, it was pretty pervasive at Jones this year for some reason, it's felt that way. Why did that occur? Well, those are those old, uh, phone systems that sit on each campus. They're uh, physical equipment that's on the campus itself. And they're just, they're old. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they were put in when I had a little more hair and better eyes. And they've, they've way past their useful life. And so they just simply break down. It's just really old electronics. So it wasn't anything with the infrastructure in that part of town? The infrastructure seems to be fine. Okay. Uh, our uh, fiber optic network, for example, is brand new. So we don't have any issues um, in that level of communication. And this phone system will ride on our district's wide area network. And so that is fine. Um, you know, we, uh, we're not seeing typically power outages. They can happen from time to time. Um, but that's pretty um, odd, odd and in times for us. So uh, as far as being able to communicate with this phone system, it's going to be riding on brand new infrastructure. Okay. Perfect. We have Thank any you. other questions or comments? Just one. I noticed we uh, didn't go with the low bidder. Is there a better quality or a different apples to the very lowest bidder there was um, just about four thousand dollars difference between the two they did not have any technicians in the state of Texas they were out on the East Coast North Carolina as I recall and so because of the need to have local support uh, when you need someone to come out uh, to help you with a problem Flying someone from North Carolina is not going to get it done in a hurry. That was the big differentiator. I mean, these days local controls in Austin, so yeah, Texas <laughs> counts, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That was a good question, Mr. Bergfeld. Thanks for pointing that out. Any other questions or discussion? If not, I'll take a motion for F. Thank you, Mr. Orbaugh. I move we approve item F. Second. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Bergfeld. Mr. Washman. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, we have item 11, the curriculum instruction consent agenda. Is there any general discussion or a request to pull any items? I don't have anything, any request to pull. I will, if anyone else does, you go ahead and do it, but I have some general, just a general comment. Why don't you go ahead? Sounds yeah, we have some great partners that we have here in Tyler, Texas, and certainly working with Smith County, even though it's with the Juvie detention. They're great partners in, in regard to that when our kids do make bad decisions and we still need to educate. Um, and then TJC is great too. And tonight we have Mentoring Alliance with us here tonight. Uh, Carlton Obie's in the back. Thank you for staying here tonight. Uh, I, I know your, uh, your boss, your executive director, is actually in Michigan 
on Lake Michigan. Uh, oh, he's, he's back? Oh, man, he must have drove all night again. No wonder he's not here tonight. So, But we, we're certainly excited with the relationships that we do have with our partners, especially Mentoring Alliance with uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club, uh, along with uh, uh, Gospel Village that provides mentoring for our families and, and our students. And, and, and one of our favorites that's really doing a great job, and that's Rose City Summer Camps. We're looking to expand that. So I want to recognize them before you all action, take an action on this uh, consent item. Any other comments? Okay, then I'll take a motion for item 11A through E. I move we approve item 11A through E. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Second? Second. Mr. Washerman. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item 12, superintendent, staff reports. First up, athletic update. Absolutely. Uh, three years ago, uh, in the summer, y'all had two vacancies. You had a superintendent of schools vacancy and you had an athletic director vacancy. And typical East Texas, y'all hired the athletic director before you hired the superintendent. Um, but it's worked out well. Uh, I think you'll find that Coach Priest has made a positive impact on our uh, athletic programs uh, here in East Texas. And, uh, and certainly we're, we're proud to have him here tonight. Just a little tidbit before he actually gets started on his end of the year athletic update. We are, uh, as part of our reporting out uh, of, of things that are important to us here that sit up here uh, in the community, we, uh, we, we actually will start doing a mid-year and an end-of-year <coughs> athletic update along with a fine arts update, mid-year and end-of-year. Miss uh, Newton's back there in the back. There she is. Uh, along with our UIL academics update. So we'll be doing a K through 12 of that too. So those are three important um, participation opportunities that are extracurricular and co-curricular in a lot of ways that we really want to make public and celebrate, but at the same time hold us, meaning our staff, accountable in regard to making those programs better, uh, more competitive, and uh, certainly more meaningful for our students. So Coach Priest, if you'll give us our end of your athletic update, we'd appreciate it. Well, thank you for, for allowing me to come and give the update on athletics. Uh, you know, I think we did some really good things this year. Um, you know, one of the main things that we need to keep doing is provide great leaders for our, for our student athletes. And, and I think we're moving in that direction, getting some great leaders. And uh, now we just need to be able to retain them uh, and keep them here and, and continue to build, build some continuity for our student athletes. But uh, kind of in front of you on that first slide, uh, you know, in that three years since I've been here, I think it's, you know, we've had uh, athletes, you know, this year we had the valedictorian and, the, and two salutatorians. Um, and each year, I think we've had at least two student athletes that have been there. Uh, so I think that's a very great accomplishment uh, and something we should be very proud of. We've had 59 academic all, all, all district members. Uh, this year we also had 15 academic all state members. Uh, so I think you know, we always want to continue to get better in that, but I think that's, that's a pretty good accomplishment. And I think we're getting a lot of, uh, you know, um, student athletes, is that's what they are. They're a student first and then an athlete, and I think we're doing a good job in the classroom. I think there's always room for impl improvement. Uh, I think our coaches are doing a good job of getting tutoring to our kids and, and, uh, and doing the right things. So if we continue to do that, I think we're, you're going to see these numbers grow. Um, as far as district championships, <coughs> Uh, we had two teams that won district championships. That was the lead tennis team. And then uh, John Tyler moving up to 6A in football this year was able to win the district championship. So that was two great. Uh, that was really great. And then uh, six individuals won nine individual district championships. Uh, and if, I, I think you all may have the individual breakdowns, but uh, we had a JT hurdler win. Uh, Claire Fisher won, uh, won tennis. She almost qualified for state. Uh, in the regional tournament, she kind of had to withdraw uh, because of an illness. Withdrew, uh, the, we withdrew to the state champion. Yeah, withdrew to the state champion. And, and, yeah, and she. And, and actually beat her in district, right? Yeah, and then yeah. lost in a playback match, yeah. uh, which is a little, little difficult. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, she had to retire. Uh, and then we had uh, Cole Van Eschenbach and Lily Dethridge won the, the uh, team tennis. Uh, our uh, mixed mixed doubles, and then Hoff Two Knight uh, has just had an unbelievable career in, in uh, cross country. 
uh, was able to win the cross country district title, then also won the 3200 meter and the 1600, uh, 1600 meter. Uh, Mary Claire Neal actually went on, she's running, she's going to be running uh, cross country at Rice now. Uh, she won the dish, uh, she actually won uh, the 1600 and the 3200 meter too. So our, you know, our, those are track and cross country is really kind of coming along. Uh, then Branson Ellis uh, has really done well, was able to win the district championship and then went on to win a state title, well, finished up runner up last year. So, so some really positive things going in that direction. Uh, as far as in the playoffs, 66 playoff qualifiers, 14 regional qualifiers, and we had two state qualifiers, which is Hop 2 Knight. And then Branson Ellis, Hop 2, uh, both of those two guys have, have made it back to back years. Uh, so, so it was very, very good to see. Some other accomplishments that we had, uh, Lee basketball, Lee girls basketball, Lee uh, girls soccer, both won the bi-district championship. That's the first time they've done that in a long time. Uh, advanced past the first round. JT football was regional finalist. And then JT girls basketball made it to their regional semifinals. Uh, and that's, that's only the second time they've ever made it that far. Uh, there are 119 all district honors. Uh, and as far as the superlatives, we've had a district MVP, two district uh, defensive MVPs, two district offensive MVPs. We had, which is very encouraging, we had the new, four newcomer of the years, and we had a, also had a district coach of the year with Coach Holmes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, state champion Branson Ellis uh, has done a great job being able to win this year. And all that being said, uh, 26 scholarship athletes. I think we had 13 at Lee and 12 at John Tyler. They, want, they were going to further their careers at the next level. Uh, some of the other things we've had, we've improved the country club sports. I think Lee, Lee golf and Lee tennis are in good position, but also JT tennis. Uh, you know, that one three years ago, I think we, when I first got here, we probably had about 15 kids in that program. I think today there's over 90. Uh, Coach Sizemore did an outstanding job over there getting that getting that program going in the right direction and uh, just has just provided great leadership. Now he's moving over to Lee uh, and I think we've got a great somebody that can come in and, and sustain that. Uh, but they, you know, JT Tennis uh, beat White House this year, uh, went into the final week. If they win the final week, they actually make the playoffs, uh, make it to, uh, uh, so they finished fifth. So it was really good. Go to the next slide. Some of the accomplishments in the middle school, you know, I guess, I, I don't know how long it had been in this, you know, how long we had done this, but um, I, I think we used to play a district schedule against other schools, but we had gotten in a, uh, gotten back to just playing the six schools. We've opened that back up, playing, playing with Lufkin and the three middle schools from Longview. I think that's helped us. I think it'll help us in the long run, being able to get us ready, uh, getting, us, getting us used to better competition, getting us used to traveling. Uh, I know going to Lufkin, you know, that's not the easiest place to go to, and, and, uh, but it, it provides us great competition. I think as you kind of sit and you play against your same schools, our six schools, and we win that city championship, you know, it's great to do. Uh, you, you know, you definitely want to take that away from anybody, but, but you're beating up on yourselves, and, and uh, we want to kind of expand out and try to go compete against the best and try to get better. Um, a couple of things that we did, we added cross country to the middle school. Uh, we ran in three meets. Uh, we had a great showing. We had a lot of kids involved, and I think that's, that's going to continue to grow. Uh, the kids were very excited. And then also we added uh, boys and girls soccer this year. Uh, we, this year we only played, a, uh, we played the seventh and eighth grade together. Uh, so we had about 30 kids at each school. Uh, more actually uh, won both of them this year, but that was a great turnout. It's been able to get, that was one of the things that our high school coaches wanted. They wanted to get the younger kids involved. Uh, I think it's helped Hogg. I think it's helped Dogan, some of those schools uh, with, their or with their Hispanic population. I think that's been a great thing. It's, I think it also helped kids uh, when you get towards the end of the year uh, and, and, and after you finish track and there was just kind of a lull there. And, and you know, overall, I think the principals have felt like it really held those kids accountable and they really had to finish strong and, uh, so they could be able to play soccer. So I think that was really good. Uh, as far as playoffs, um, you know, we've been able to, ho been pretty fortunate to be able to ho host several playoffs. Uh, it's kind of the luck of the draw. Um, depends on, you know, who wins and how, 
how the districts align, but we hosted three football games this, this past year. We hosted eight playoff games, eight soccer games, and then we also hosted the 4A Regional Boys and Girls Soccer, uh, soccer Tournament at Rose. Um, we also host the UIL 4A Regional Golf Tournament, and, uh, which is a beating, but, but, I, but I, we do it. That's what you uh, get for having that. <laughs> you get for being a head coach, that, of a, that's former right. head coach of a Division I golf that, program. That's right. So, but we did host that, and, and, and that's, been, that's been fun. Um, and then we, you know, since we put in turf, we've been able to host a lot of playoff games uh, with baseball at Mike Carter. And uh, I think each year we've been able to host the regional, you know, the regional final. We hosted Lufkin last year, Lufkin and White House, when White House went in and make it to the state tournament, and then, and then uh, Pleasant Grove and Decatur played this year. So we've had some really good baseball uh, been attracted here, so, so that's been good. Uh, next slide, slide, facility improvements. I don't know if any of y'all have been over to uh, Rose Stadium, Chris's training, Mother Francis Rose Stadium. Uh, but we're improving the ADA seating. Uh, that, is, that, that project is moving along very nicely. Uh, if you kind of look at this, I mean, that's the scoreboard from, that we've used for several years. And as Dr. Crawford said, a little, a little coat of paint goes a long way. I think uh, that's, that's a significant improvement. But, but I think the fans will be very excited about what they're going to see with the aisles and, and the railings. And, and uh, I think in the next coming years, uh, with what we have planned, this is going to be a, a first-class uh, stadium again. Uh, Mike Carter, uh, we're going to make some improvements at, uh, on the scoreboard there. Uh, also, you know, back this past year, this was the first year we did it, but we went back and really tried to improve those JV gyms at, at both Lee and John Tyler, adding wall padding and, and uh, new backboards. And, and, uh, and then just refinish those courts. So it really gave us some pop and made it look better uh, than what they have in the past. So, so, so the JV, so they, JV gym at John Tyler, Ooh. does it have glass backboards? It does. Okay. It had those wood backboards. Plywood. Plywood, plywood. yeah. That's old, plywood that's old and, school right there. And then it had those wall padding that was ripped and-, and Carpet. Uh, yeah, carpet. Carpet wall padding. Yeah, we used to, it wasn't shag, but it was, but, uh, but it was carpet. So, but we got those replaced. So it does look better back there. Uh, I think that'll kind of get us through until we can get to the new, you know, to the new gyms. Um, but uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. We're going to continue to make improvements. So we've got a long way to go, uh, but, but we're going in the right direction. Um, last but not least, got the Aquatic Center. Uh, you know, it's a great facility. Uh, I think that has really helped us a lot. Uh, Tyler Lee has 45 swimmers. I don't think we had anybody from John Tyler uh, last year, but I was speaking with Coach Petty. Uh, we've had about four to six kids interested from John Tyler in, in coming into swimming now. Uh, so that, that's very encouraging. You know, I, I think that uh, the more we can continue to do that, I think it's going to continue to grow. So, so that's going to be very good. Middle school, that's, well, that's where we've probably seen the biggest jump. Um, it, it went from probably about 20 to 25 kids to over 65 this year. Uh, and, and we started providing transportation. So I think, you know, not only with the new pool, uh, but also because we've been able to provide the transportation, that's really helped, helped increase that. Uh, the the uh, Tyler Rose Aquatic Club, uh, we took that. You know, that's, that's new for us. Uh, it's a year-round swim program with, with uh, USA Swim uh, for ages 5 to 18. And so that we went on to, to uh, compete in several events. Um, membership has grown. We started out with about 50 members. Now we've got a little over 100. And uh, so we're con continuing to see some growth. Picked up my daughter. So uh, I, I didn't, uh, that's great. She's enjoying it. Uh, so I, I'm hanging out at the pool a little bit more now. Mm -hmm. Uh, in January, we hired Ryan West uh, to uh, serve as a head coach for our track. I think that's, and, and then we hired several uh, hourly employees. So it's, uh, it's continuing to grow. It's, it's, been, it's been very positive. Additionally, additional programs that we offer, the Masters uh, Swimming Program. I think Mr. Uh, Reverend Hager, he's in that. Um, and we've got a little bit over 40 swimmers on that. The Tyler Aquadillos, uh, a young youth group. Five to 18, got about 35 swimmers in there. We're offering swim lessons. Uh, they're also doing swim, uh, swim instructions and water safety through the Willow Bend Orphanage uh, during the summer. 
and then we also provide lifeguard training classes so those are those are really good this year uh, we hosted our first high school meet and we were able to host three of those in the fall uh, and they had great showings for that uh, a lot of people a lot of interest um, and so I, I think this the response from everybody that came uh, even talking to Rockwall uh, you know they were very excited and and uh, when I talked to Neil uh, the guy that on that runs the Rockwall uh, Aquatic Center he, he was wanting to come back down and, and was looking forward to coming back down and competing in this pool uh, first time ever competed you know we also had two middle school meets that we ran in the spring um, so that's and I think that's where we're seeing the biggest improvement those kids that uh, the middle school kids are improving their times. Um, the track kids are really, you're really starting to see those younger kids starting to take off. And, you know, as we have, I've gotten results back from the kids, uh, from the coaches as they, as they're training this summer and swimming in meets, our times are continuing to go up and it's, it's very positive. Um, the Aquadillos and track, uh, East Texas swim, all those over 250 participants. Um, the Aqua run. We had that, and I had over 100 participants, and then uh, just with Masters, we held a kind of an intra-squad meet with uh, track, Aquadillos, and Masters this year. So, so those are some of the things that we've had. Uh, as I said, I, I think we're going in the right direction. We have a long way to go uh, overall in everything that we're doing, but, but we want to make sure we continue to get great leaders uh, and, and retain them, uh, and, and we want to provide the best experience that we can for our student athletes. And uh, I mean, we're in the kid business and uh, we want to make sure that everything that we're doing is to the highest quality that we can and continue to move and but we want to be we want to compete for championships in every sport that we have so uh, thank you i'll open it up for any questions questions for coach priest i'll just uh, say thank you for rebuilding the foundation for a lot of these programs and uh, it's great hearing about the aquatic center I was curious, is it, is there anything that we need out there or is it serving the purpose like we thought or better or how is that overall? I, I think it, you know, it's for sure serving its purpose. Um, you know, it, I think we're starting to learn more and more. Uh, I for sure and, and did not have a lot of experience in pool maintenance. Um, I'm learning. Um, I, I think that's probably been our biggest challenge, uh, just with the heat of the water. I think it's great. I mean, it's still good. Um, we've got to find some ways to kind of get the, the, the temperature of the water down during the summer. It's only, you know, it's, I guess it's for several months, I mean, maybe three months that you really have to worry about it. But I, I think overall, everything else has been really good. We've, we're trying different things. We're trying the aerators and and spraying water and and uh, but I and it's holding it around 83 degrees, uh, which is about one degree too high to be able to host a USA mm -hmm. swim meet. But you can still practice in that when it starts getting to 86 and things like that. But we've kept it down uh, over the last few weeks, so it's that that's been positive. Um, but I think everybody has raved about the pool. Uh, I, I mean, it's I think when you drive over there and you go over to it, it's impressive. Uh, it, it really is, and and uh, we should definitely be proud of it. I would say in the future, it, whenever you feel like it, if you're coming to us twice a year, you know, I'd love to see how we're comparing with our peers, uh, other other schools in um, you know in our district, in our region, you know, just kind of comparisons on uh, on how we're doing um, okay. and and it doesn't have to be all good news every time you know I'd love to know you know here's where we are here's where we're heading and and uh, well I did try to get you know they come out with the uh, Lone Star Cup results and I tried to get the results for that of where we stood. They only list the top 10. Yeah, we weren't. Uh, we were not in the top 10. <laughs> uh, and I call, I've called the UIL several times. I tried to get, a, get the results of where we stood. Uh, I know when I first got here, we were out of, well, Lee was around 300 out of 400 and 
402 schools, somewhere around there, and John Tyler was around 200 out of about 500 schools. So uh, I, I would like to see where we finish this year. I, I couldn't get those final results, but but I think we're better than what we were. But, man, we really want to get up in the – for sure in the top half uh, to start and, and then start trying to compete at a, at a more higher level. But uh, as I said, it's going to come down to getting good people, uh, being able to attract people, you know, the salaries and, and those things, as you said, for our teachers. And uh, I think have allowed us to attract people. Uh, but now it's retaining them, and, and we've got to build some continuity and hold and hold people here so we can build programs well, and not continue to start over. Our community, in regard to that, and that's not why we went to to bond for May sixth. But when you start talking about the the individual that you hired for the Lee softball job and his ability to look towards the future on at least having a decent facility to practice his kids at, if not play at, is going to play a big, a big role as far as your high schools go. Uh, outstanding middle school facilities and the three new ones that we have, we've made some improvements elsewhere. At least everyone's got a track now. Yeah. So, um, but in saying that, I think that's where you're going to make an impact on that is that we, you don't have a softball coach that drives by the softball field and sees what we've had there for years. Um, sad and uh, certainly glad that we now have leadership in place and a, a board in place and a supportive community to be able to correct some of those things and and, and so I, I don't even know his name but he, he, he was a winning state yeah uh, coach, coach Niffin uh, state qualifier uh, at a lower lower classification but I'm here to tell you as having a kid that played at the lower classification they could play with the the six A's so we're, we're very excited about bringing him in he came in from Paul Pewitt or Winsboro, where did he come from? Harleton. Harleton. And so saying that, I think that's going to be able, uh, that's going to allow us to, uh, uh, to maybe to, to grab some folks that, that may have looked at us and just turned the, their nose up at us because we did not have adequate facilities. We're not building Taj Mahals. I mean, we're taking a football stadium that was built in 1940 and renovating what we can uh, as opposed to going out and building a $60 million football stadium like – everyone else is doing we we prioritize our stuff correctly in my opinion uh to where we can have great experiences for our kids number one and then have great people to to, to lead them well i just want to thank thank you thank the board and dr Crawford, because y'all have allowed us to do some really good things and and uh, especially in the time that i've been here and just being able to improve make improvements but just show the commitment that that you guys have for athletics and and uh, and academics and and so i appreciate everything you guys have, have given us given me and, and given us the ability to go do the things that we need to do so thank you guys very much coach priest i um it doesn't show up in these numbers but athletics is probably the primary teacher of leadership and character within our school district and so i know through countless small interactions with your coaches and just the stories I hear from parents that that's not reflected in these numbers but that is uh, highly valued by our community that this be good experiences for these young people that it causes them to grow as leaders and as young men and women um, and that they can do that with excellence and we can continue to compete so I thank you for it I'd like to piggyback on something Mr. Bergfeld said um, comparing is is a challenge and so comparing against your peers I think if we can figure out a way to do that that's good um, you've presented a very thorough picture of what's happening here so in future reports if we can compare to prior years that would be another way to kind of measure our progress yes you know our district champions going up our scholarships going up um, so I'd encourage you as we standardize this report in the future that um, comparing to peers is, is, is desired. Comparing to ourselves and where we were last year is also uh, another thing that I'd like us to see. Yes, sir. Um, and then lastly, on the, on the Aquatic Center, I know we had lots of concerns about temperature. Um, I'm not aware of us missing a single day due to cold weather. Uh, we've, we had some we, equipment we failures that maybe we, we missed a, a practice or two, but throughout all the winter, the kids continued to swim. Um, really without incident um, and so that part of the pool has been a success these numbers obviously are very impressive in terms of participation um, 
I'd ask you to consider transportation for the North Tyler schools. Um, that's going to be one of the ways yes. that we open up participation in swimming there um, as well. Uh, yeah, I think that's promoting it. I, I think the getting the principals to promote and our coaches to promote and just make just making awareness mm -hmm. uh, of letting the kids know that it's there and and uh, or that it is available uh, will be our biggest thing. And and uh, but yeah, you're correct. I don't think we miss any days. We might have had to jump out for lightning a couple of times, but but uh, but other than that, uh, they pool, swam. Pool never turned green. Never turned green. Never turned green. The it, the incidence of breathing problems, asthma and allergies are way way down um, amongst the swimmers as well. So health of the kids is improved as a result. Now our maintenance kind of went up. The cost, the maintenance cost went up a little bit. Yeah, it's a bigger. Uh, we move a lot yeah. more water than uh, we used uh, to. A lot bigger in pool. The, in the but, pool. But, and I commend you. I know we're trying to get the temperature the right keep it cool enough to where it's safe for kids to swim and I know you've you've taken some action there in the last couple of weeks and um, and are continuing to monitor the situation to make sure we get the full use out of that pool so thank you for doing that yeah. shade might be a, a little help wouldn't to keep the pool cooler yes yeah especially since I may be sitting in the stands a little bit too that'd be good <laughs> nice yeah. to shade on it too. we're just going to shade the pool not the bleachers <laughs> if it happens but okay. that is something you're looking at still Yes, yes. I, I just don't. I, I think we, it's gonna I have to get with Mr. Loper. See how it's gonna be. It's not gonna be cheap though. It, it's gonna be. It's definitely gonna be an expense. Just but. sell some land on Copeland. <laughs> and North Tyler Day too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a good point. Future revenue. All right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank Any you guys. Anything else for Coach Priest? Thank you. Next up, quarterly investment report. Uh, quarterly investment report is in your packet. Uh, uh, again, Ms. Bjork apologizes for not being here tonight. She's had, she has a traditional uh, m many decades family uh, uh, reunion that, that occurs at this time and want to make sure that she attended that. Uh, great family they are. So if you have any questions in regard to that, uh, again, we're closing the books out. Uh, the auditors have been in here this uh, doing their preliminary stuff. And of course, they'll be here once we've actually wrapped up this fiscal, which ends August 31st. New fiscal begins September 11th. If you have any questions about where we are, we're on track, we're in really good shape. Uh, you're more than welcome to call Tasha uh, here uh, next week uh, when she returns. Okay. Item 12, discussion. First up is internal audit committee. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the charter, uh, Reverend Hager, it is your responsibility to appoint a chair of the audit committee and we want to make sure we gave you that opportunity to do so there is there's actually one person here tonight that is actually on the audit committee and one person that is not so you can choose the one that's not or the one that is here <laughs> well the one who is not has volunteered for another year while mr martinez gains a fuller understanding of internal audits so I'll appoint uh, Reverend Mason to chair the audit committee. Okay. We'll, we'll let her know. It won't come as a surprise. Next up, student code of conduct, first reading. So we have student code of conduct that's available for you. Um, certainly in, in, in many years when the legislative session uh, concludes, uh, sometimes you have a, a completely revamped student code of conduct Sometimes you don't have anything touched at all. Tonight we have Assistant Superintendent of Schools Raleigh Sanchez, along with John Johnson, who works in constituent services for us, to uh, maybe take you through a brief uh, overview of the student code of conduct, because we have a really robust presentation from the athletic director just now. Absolutely, and it's gonna be very brief. Uh, good evening, thank you, board. Dr. Crawford, uh, board president, Reverend Hager, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we're very fortunate that last year we went through a very extensive look at our student code of conduct and even up above what the legislator was asking us to do to ensure the safety of our schools, uh, maintain a safe and orderly environment so that our teachers could teach and our kids could learn. Last year with the help of John Johnson and the committee, we went through a very robust look at our own student code of conduct and put some things in place already that would ensure that our schools were safe. Uh, because we know that unless our schools are safe, our kids aren't learning. 
and our teachers don't have an opportunity to teach. So just some of the highlights that we do want to look at that we changed this year that there's some modifications to was the school bus conduct. So what we did is uh, John Baggard and his crew um, got a committee together that included principals, teachers, and assistant principals, and took a look at the conduct of what's happening with students while they're on the bus. And because we know that the school bus is an extension of our schools. And so we want to make sure that kids are acting right in classrooms and they're also acting correctly while they're on the bus. And so there are some provisions in there in the event that a student decides that uh, they want to make a bad choice or make a bad decision while they're on the school bus, then there's some, some language in there that affords us an opportunity to take some disciplinary action against them. Another thing that we've also, which we did this past year, is that we understand that at times kids make some really, really bad decisions. And they make decisions that impact them as an adult. And we have to understand that we still have kids in our schools that are affected by that. And I'm referencing the registered sex offenders. And so last year we made sure that we put in our student code of conduct the language that indicates that any kid that is a registered sex offender, not just registered, but is on deferred, that they will maintain their educational environment at the DAEP placement. They won't be in DAEP, DAEP registered as a student of DAEP, but they will maintain their educational environment at the DAEP until the conclusion of either the deferment and or until they are no longer registered as sex offenders. So that's really important to us, important to the community, and important to our school board. And the last thing that we want to make note is the bullying. We understand that you know, bullying seems to be very pervasive now in our system and in our, in our world, and so we've made some provisions in, in our student code of conduct, including cyberbullying, that we take action against students that involve themselves in some type of bullying, whether it's cyberbullying and or personal bullying. So those are the three highlights that uh, are in your student code of conduct this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, there was a change on the length of knives, um, or am I thinking of another policy up later? <laughs> yeah, you might, because the, the length of the knives have, hasn't changed from what I understand. Uh, there's new legislation about all the great things we can carry in the state of Texas, bigger knives, swords, and spears, and um, I, I'll find where it was, but in one of our policies tonight, we have, uh, we get to carry longer knives, but we don't get to carry spears and swords, so. Uh, Is that on the first reading, one of the first readings? Yeah, it must be on one of the first readings. I'll like find it in my notes here in a second. Let's see. <clears throat> but we don't have to wait on that. Um, we did, I think, kind of with our theme about reporting, using numbers to report, and certainly something, maybe this comes from Chapter 37 data, uh, whenever we're able to do that, maybe in the fall, we'll need to take a look at probably how many placements we had, well, longitudinal. I, I'm glad that you asked that question, Dr. Crawford, because I happen to have that data available for you today. Well, okay. We didn't Imagine talk about that. that today. So, as you all know that last year, um, we made it another concerted effort to make sure that the kids who were behaving in a manner that was not conducive to what Tyler expected them to do, that we were going to place them in the DAEP. And so that's one of the reasons why we moved DAEP from this place, Port Plyler, to the OP, which we now call DAEP. And that's, a, it's a, there's no thrill in that. We just call it DAEP, and that's what it is. And so we did see an increase, if you will, of the number of students that were going to DAEP um, from elementary to middle school to high school as a result of understanding that our schools were going to be safe and we were not going to uh, allow kids to act inappropriately, behave inappropriately, and still stay in our schools because as a parent, as a lot of you guys are, we weren't going to allow one child to impact the learning of 27, 28, or 22 other children. So that was important to us. And so overall, you know, we had anywhere from uh, five additional kids to 50 additional kids at our high school, as you can imagine, because the population is higher there. Any other questions? I do think the new facility is more therapeutic for um, a learning environment so that their learning can continue. Uh, certainly the classroom spaces are, are larger over at DAP than they were here. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's actually an old school. There's a lot of there's now an, an, an enclosed courtyard there. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there to, to capitalize on uh, the continuing of education once they actually go to alternative school. Uh, one thing it did allow us to do as we wrap this up uh, was we, and I shared this last year, we weren't shortening some of the time that we had assigned for, for a kid. Um, they still have opportunities to, to earn good, good behavior credit. <coughs> But we, we weren't so limited in space that we were having to shorten some of that time when there was an overflow trying to, trying to be assigned over here. Um, do appreciate our principals. They made an enhanced improvement. I don't have quantitative data to give the board. Uh, but thanks to Mr. Sanchez and Mr. Jones, they did a great job. The principals did starting to follow protocols um, a whole lot better than they ever did my, my, my first two years here. Uh, in regards to making sure that we were uh, recording placement hearings and, and interacting with constituent services. Mr. Johnson's here. You may want to let him say hello at least tonight, Mr. Sanchez. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that, that uh, Mr. I will say this about Mr. Johnson and constituent services. They've done a good job over there of the, in regard to the onboarding of students and the offloading of students once they have uh, completed their placement back onto the campuses. So uh, that was something that was really missing uh, until last year. And I, commend y'all for, for really tightening that process up. I might also add, in, in the event that the enrollment increases, we also staff the campus accordingly. So there are times that we have to hire some additional teachers at DAEP to make sure that we have the right staffing formula over there as well. I did find the knife reference. It is in the Student Code of Conduct. It's on page 31. And as written, we're going to permit students to bring a knife as long as the blade is not bigger than five and a half inches, which seems like a very large knife to <laughs> allow kids to bring to school. So I know that's how the law changed in the state of Texas, and that's probably just flown through here automatically. But So that's, that's the illegal knife, Raleigh. I mean, that's you, yeah. Mr. Sanchez, which you and I have a lot of experience in, in our <laughs> 10 years ago. My point is we don't allow kids to carry a knife. It's the identification of what an illegal knife is. So um, we don't have, you know, much needs for even for you to carry a knife or an ag program or anything. So that's just the, the way that the, 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 the penal code actually determines whether or not an illegal knife is criminal or uh, if it's shorter than that, it's still a violation of student code of conduct. It just doesn't kick over into – Danny Brown's world, Chief okay. Brown's world. Okay. Good catch. But once you found that, I, I have was... kids who would like to bring knives, so I just want to make sure I understand <laughs> what the rules are. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Appreciate Thank you. Right. Mr. Johnson wants to say hi. <laughs> Hello, board. Thank you, Mr. President, Superintendent. Goodbye. <laughs> Can you bring forks to school? Forks? Forks. Forks. Okay. So different. Okay, item C. Forks over knives. First reading for a handful of policies. Yeah, a handful of policies. Let me just give you kind of a rundown of what's in there. Added policies, policies of instructional resources and curriculum design. Um, these are all statutorily influenced, by the way, or TASB or other folks have just not had a, very much to do this summer. They've deleted or con combined some as well. Instructional materials, not to be confused with instructional resources that were added, along with curriculum development. And then they replaced community relations and fundraising policies with new policies, campus charters, um, graduation uh, policy that aligns better to House Bill 5 pathways, the way things are graduating now that we no, have, no longer have any tax kids um, on, our, uh, on, our, on our rolls and then credit by examination and what the board can approve uh, as far as the assessments used for credit by examination. So first reading, you guys um, read through these and let me know if there's any questions about any of this and we'll get you in the right direction or I'll answer that question as well. Okay, item D. D is a, a recommendation from Ms. Bjork in regard to some finance policy, local policy CH in regard to some thresholds uh, for purchasing and acquisitions. Uh, so, so take a look at that. If you have any questions about that, 
contact myself, Tasha Bjork, or Nakia Burrell. Okay, future business. Board workshop August 3rd. I think we have, uh, in fact, I think y'all were provided that tonight, the agenda. Uh, we, we pushed this one back a little bit deeper into the uh, summer months so we could all have some vacation time. Uh, so we'll have one August 3rd. Uh, you'll have some Rose Stadium uh, actions to consider there along with uh, budget and finance. That's extremely important, obviously. We're in that season right now. Uh, certainly keeping an eye on what's going on in Austin. August 3rd school is a cool event. I encourage you to go to that. That's the same day as the board workshop or right after it. Summer school graduation, August 11th at Caldwell Auditorium. Mr. Jones presiding. Regular meeting, August 21st. Um, that's the night that we will actually adopt the budget. Uh, you'll consider it and adopt it. Um, the sessions should be over with by then, unless they've called another one. Another one. <laughs> keep calling them. Uh, in the first day of school for students, August 28th this year, even though Mr. Bergfield would like to push that like September 15th. We got convocation in between there too. Yeah. What date is convocation? Convocation is in there, and it's not on here. Twenty it is August the twenty fifth, which is a Friday. Mm -hmm. Green Acres. See, I told y'all they were going to let us come back. Uh, they actually were having construction there on their sound system, and when people looking at me like, "What'd you do?" Uh, but we're actually back at Green Acres, and it'll start at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Uh, the theme this year is the home team. Can you say what day was that? August 25th? Yes, sir. It's okay. Friday. Friday you going to be there, Mr. Washburn? I'll be there. Mr. Martinez. Man. Okay. I will now be there. You will not be there? I will. Oh, good. Yeah. Since they've moved the time of that other thing. When, when are they? Friday night? Really? Okay, good. All right. And football season's coming up. So kickoff luncheon's uh, coming up. Uh, and then we have Friday night and one Saturday game, I think, leaves on Saturday. That first week classic of school? this year. Uh, uh, yeah, September 1st is the first game. They're away. And then September 8th and 9th are, are, is the classic. Okay. Okay. Then I will accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. Come on. <laughs> second. <laughs> All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? And we stand adjourned.